really? <laughs> Topic. Here's a topic for the news section. Did anybody notice that uh, the uh, scurrilous rumors about ATI drivers getting open source? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, since Intel did it, <laughs> and, you know, and I, I was shocked because everyone saw that today, right, where the Intel, or recently Intel open sourced their, uh, I think it's called August. The graphics drivers? They, they, for their brand new chipset, they open source the drivers. And the, the weird part about it was, guess who was announcing it? Lo and behold, Keith Packard. So apparently it's hire Keith Packard for, to work for your giant corporation and you'll have great drivers. Well, no, there's a surprise. <laughs> no, but that's what NVIDIA did when they when they released their, their uh, Linux drivers. They hired, they like released they the first Keith. crap ones and then they hired Keith. Yeah. And then they got to where they are now, and apparently Keith has moved on. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it's hard to say who would hire. Who, 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 who would be better to hire? So, so what the network is the uh, IRC thing? And all that stuff. Freno? Yeah. Is there people trying to get in? And the group is Fountain? Uh, it should be one. Oh, I haven't seen in a while. So if anyone is carry when they come in, uh, I might know the IRC. I have something. I just, I'm just saying I don't know what he looks like. So there's just there was somebody I didn't know. Somebody. Oh, okay. So what server do we have today? Yeah, Mike, when I called Carrie, he said the president sent me zero. And the message said, uh, the system is paging carry at this moment, and it like, was dialing off. So, your password is in there? Okay. Okay. And the first time I've said this, I'm ready. Oh, right. What, what, what this guy has done is on some of our school and uh, uh, left about four of them. So, uh, he kind of writes them up. I'm not sure what he's going to do with it. How do you spell it, Master? Uh, <laughs> like, Master <laughs> is. That's interesting. I'm just going to throw her what it's going to allow Where people sound out things, it doesn't help me spell. Okay. This is why I can't spell. Just remember Shakespeare could be a I can spell, I can spell the, thing the same way. It's the important part of the program. The important part is understanding. Well, people don't reverse the work, but you know, the idea is that you just keep piling on more and more and more. Well, that's <laughs> Oh, look, I'm coming back. Hey, there you are. They'll look at the but they'll ignore all the stuff that you want to recognize. Right. 
I know, I'm sure my laptop will crash or someone is going to hack it because <laughs> I'm saying it out loud on the screen. Run now, quickly! Oh no, I'm not running a firewall at all. I can't even Don't, don't kill my laptop. You said all that didn't work, we'll try something new. Look at, what is hardware space in the laptop? One of the features I need to describe. Yeah, I did it.
I see three people. Yeah, do it. Do it. Yeah. But there was a peak of seven. But that means me. He's spamming on freedom. I know. Check out this one line. She talked to one of the guys. Two minutes for the bounty. Let us well. Yeah, go ahead. Carrie likes the temper. I love how Alon is talking about it and then you come in and say, and then he's really nice. He talks about the stream working. All right, I'm going to stop talking about IRC in the meeting. Um, oh, it's up there. Everybody want free stuff? He's got free stuff. He's got a box of like Nobel discs and. Oh, I'm sure. I think about like vacations. Everyone uh, come get Linspire books. I don't know. It's, I know most people need it. It's like you know, it's something at some point. Yeah, if you're shy. Um, or we can pass them out. But door, door, door. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, we're going to talk about the setup. Um, so. I don't know how to pronounce it because, you know, I can't pronounce anything I've only ever read on the internet. Not a little bit of a I'm not the only one. <laughs> uh, those are the guys that the... Yeah, uh, basically it's uh, it's all based on uh, G the GStreamer framework and it's streaming... Uh, Ogvorbis, I mean Ogfior and Ogvorbis, Ogstreams, which uh, takes a bit of, of actual horsepower, like a two point, uh, F1 XP 2400 couldn't do it, uh, reliably at least, it was kind of jittery. Uh, but that, like, a Ford Duo laptop is doing it, so. Okay. They also have a Java applet, so you, you have, you can play this stream uh, without actually having to install a video client on your system, as long as you have Java running on your system, you could uh, just install, you could, you could just have the, go to a website, and build the app, play, play the stream, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, uh, I know it's all about Flash Video, but Flash Video is actually not really anything. It's actually just a container format for like MP4 or something. And it uses the systems the system decoder to actually do it. Um, thanks, but I'm not sure. Someone please let him in. Um, and uh, that's it. There's a there's a management interface for it with a wizard to let you choose how you would like it to be. Or if you wanted to test it, you can do TV capture cards or web cameras or DV. You can choose a lot of different configurations for how you want to uh, configure that. And just on a side note, because I said this three times already, so I must be excited about it. Um, but with uh, GNOME here, the, it has a little uh, little smiley face, means it's working, and it puts it in the notification area, which is kind of cool, I think. Especially since this application is actually running on a different computer than the one you're looking at. Um, but you know, that's what X is for, right? So everyone forgets that, it pisses me off. <laughs> um, is there any other news anyone wanted to talk about or anything cool? Anyone want to uh, help evangelize Linux and open source and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the DevSig, right as we were about to head on over to the barbecue, this guy walked up and He's looking for people to help teach Linux to the community in the area. I got a bunch of his flyers. If anybody wants to look into that to help this guy, uh, come by and grab them. All right. And uh, I've got a bunch of hardware that I brought over. And these gentlemen were kind enough to show me where you were located. <laughs> and uh, it's price is right, it's free. I've got a couple of 30 gig uh, tape backups in their SCSI cards. Uh, Power supplies. So if anybody's interested, well, just come take a look. 
Okay. Cool. Well, I'm sure it's it's got the exact right price. <laughs> um, yeah. Jeff didn't show up, so I guess he won't talk about whatever he's talking about. Um, and uh, I brought the. There's uh, memory and uh, hard disk and few cables and uh, more memory cords, uh, various cords. A uh, good power supply. I think it's uh, 350. Cool. Um, anyway, we're on the table. All right. There's more free stuff over there. If you just got here, there's some uh, Linspire. Folks slash this and uh, some Laval something. Uh, that's free stuff, actually. That. Game is game. Game is game. Good job. Oh, I'm never going to remember that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'm doing horribly up here today. Is there a sign machine? No. Didn't make one this time, sorry. Um, <laughs> it carries it worth uh, worth mentioning the ATI rumors. It's pure scurrilous rumors. That's what makes it fun. Oh, I guess I hadn't actually heard it um, before you mentioned it. Yeah. Well, I suppose everybody knows that the AMD bought ATI. So the latest rumor was almost could have been predicted, you know, two seconds after. But the latest rumor is that uh, AMD might just open source the uh, ATI drive, which is pretty significant for us since we don't actually have any 3D <laughs> open source drivers that matter. Other cards you can actually still buy. Um, actually, the, except for the Intel. The Intel drivers are. Yeah, yeah. but they're not known for that being super 3D. They're but, not, but were those the ones that they put in laptop? I mean, those were laptop, were those laptop drivers? All of their drivers up to date, to this date, are actually GPL. Well, the and in the, DRI, yeah. in the DIR, that's North Fork Street. Right, well see, the um, significance of that is that they actually sell more than anybody else. They're just low end. Yeah. Um, but they're apparently Intel's brand new, like 965 chipsets. They're brand new chipsets, <coughs> maybe not really in the real world yet, has an open source driver. Um, and that has all the fancy programmable vortex, whatever, super magic um, features in it um, that I don't really understand because, yeah, I never had to deal with that kind of intense 3D stuff. Um, anyways, those are supposedly open source as of today, even though they're not production quality drivers. They're literally they open source them, not being production quality. But, okay. what? Which does suggest that maybe XGL isn't, you know, the path to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, XGL isn't that the one. One of them, one of the technologies. <coughs> oh, no, it's the other. One. It's the because there's two 3D desktop technologies, right? So there's XGL and there's the other one. Yeah. And the other one actually won't run on anything closed source because it requires some features. That well, it's not closed. XGL. Yeah. <laughs> XGL will only run on the closed source drivers, and then the other one, which is like X. I forget, it's the one that's made it in a fedora or was going to be in a fedora. It was the one that uh, yeah. Red Hat was pushing. Red Hat was pushing. Um, will actually not have, require some features that the proprietary drivers don't actually provide. Right? Yeah. So, how could that have happened? <laughs> <laughs> the feature is, are you open source? Yes. Okay, I'll run. No, that's not it. Actually, they're actually <laughs> using a specific feature that the open source drivers provide. But, yeah, like you said, it's a good thing Intel has decided that they sell a lot of hardware and it's not secret sauce. So well, the truth is, yeah, I mean, they sell, you sell more than anybody else. So there is the issue of, will you ever be able to run Linux, you know, after if everybody go, if we go to XGL, uh, yeah. so it's kind of nice to be able to actually install. <coughs> and, 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 and to not have to install your own graphics drive. Well, yeah, I had that problem with that laptop, which is the, the, it has GPL drivers, but they're too new to be in actually any place where you get a binary. But, um, uh, well, 
When Carrie is ready, I will stop. This is Todd rambling up here, by the way. When you're ready. Oh, I, I was just letting you go. So. Okay. Yeah, I, that's why I'm, I, I'm making that clear. Do we, uh, uh, what's the link for people to, to view this? This uh, is stream.sgdelug.org. Sure, Mike. Oh, I could do that. <laughs> yeah. so, so is this still beta, Mike, or are we going to put this on the website? That you can do this if you can't attend. It's beta at the moment because uh, I literally, I was trying to use a different computer like the day, the day before last and it just wasn't working. And so I was like, I give up and then I'm like, oh wait, I have this or do a laptop here that happens to have built-in firewire. Hmm, I wonder if I should try plugging it into that. And so I actually came over here a little earlier than I normally do and plug it in and lo and behold, it worked. So <coughs> You might also mention the IRC channel. Oh yeah. We, SGV Lug does have an IRC channel. It's a uh, pound SGV Lug on uh, free node. Um, which Rick, some of us have actually started monitoring just for the heck of it. So. <laughs> is it a new thing? Or how do you use it? Uh, uh, I don't know. Let's make a month. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> we're going to make it. Yeah, we're going to have a Java applet pretty soon so people could go there at work or something. You don't have an IRC yeah. So it. right. Now the reason for mentioning both of those at the same time is notice the combined effect. No one ever has to come again. You sit at home, watch the streaming video, <laughs> and discuss it on IRC. <laughs> Except I, I know I'm not going to show up and talk in a room of empty, an, an, an empty room. I don't know how many speakers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. The first time. <laughs> Maybe. What do you want me to show? Do you want me to room? I know. I know. <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> now, if only, David, if only David Lawyer would actually pay for broadband, he could actually attend the meeting. Kerry <laughs> <laughs> Garrison, right? Yep. He's going to talk about voice over IP. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, later. Yeah, there is. Uh, what resolution should that scan? Is this 1024 or? Yeah, that's what I have mine in, so um, it works there. How's that? There we go. How many people have heard of Asterisk? Used it? <laughs> wow, okay. IP PBXs in general, open switch, uh, uh, free switch, so SIPX, there's a number of them out there. We started a couple years ago playing around with Asterisk when a friend showed it to me and said, oh, you got to check this out. This is really cool. And so I started playing around with it, used it in my own business. We have an IT consulting firm down in Irvine, Tech Data Pros. And what we found is we were able to cut down our cell phone bill dramatically because we were able to install soft phones on our laptops so that wherever we went we had an extension going back to the PBX that was in the, in the office. And the PBX was simply built on an old you know, Pentium 3 400 at the time. And it was very simple to get up and running and play with and do some really cool things. And then I went to I was at Best Buy one day and I had, they found this $12 cordless phone with a $12 rebate. Cool. Hooked up to a little adapter, and that's what I carried around. And I was, if I was going to be at a client's office for a couple hours, I would just plug that in. And they'd come by and they'd see the phone ring, and they're like, "How is your phone ringing here?" I'm like, well, and I would explain it. And finally, we started actually selling systems based on Asterisk, and we've done pretty good. Uh, we've got, uh, I've lost track of how many actual jobs we've done, but we've done jobs for um, a system for Miramax Films. We're doing 66 Carl's Juniors next month. Uh, anything from two stations to 92 is our range right now. So it's a very simple system to kind of deal with and work with and do some different things. So we're going to kind of go from the basics up to actual seeing some of the components and, and look at some different websites that we can talk about. So an IP PBX system, most of them are Linux based today. Uh, name brand ones include Freecom's NBX system, if anyone's seen that. It's kind of a nice little box, a web interface, it's really easy to get up and running. The phones are, 
you know, business quality phones, and uh, it, it's a good system. And they base that on Linux with their own <coughs> switch software. In it. Asterisk from Digium is probably the fastest growing open source PBX out there. Started from you know, kind of a, a dream to have a software-based phone system, and it's evolved into an extremely powerful product these days. Uh, for the most part, Asterisk by itself is driven by config files. They don't have their own web interface, but there's a number of them out there from third-party people that have been put on. We'll, we'll look at one of those in particular later. Sipex from uh, Sip Foundry, one of the, the second guys out there, they're shipped with a full web interface on it. Not quite as powerful as Asterisk because it's kind of locked down into their interface right now, but it's growing very quickly. And FreeSwitch is another one which has kind of got a, a nice grassroots movement going right now. And any new technology that is coming out, like Jobber integration or, or the Google Jingle stuff and XMPP and all number of new things that are coming out in this whole realm of voice over IP, they're really moving forward on quickly. So I look to see FreeSwitch as being a very popular product over the next year or so in this whole IP PBX space. If you guys have any questions, you know, just ask, throw your hands up, whatever, get up and dance, and just let me know. So, uh, otherwise, I'm just going to ramble and ramble and ramble forever. But if you have a specific question on something, just let me know. Uh, an IP PBX system is different from a traditional system in that there's no dedicated hardware per se. We run these on Pentium class machines, Xeon processors, the, you know, just your typical Dell that you can buy throw Linux on it and install the software and you can get these up and running. And it, they are full-blown phone systems, extensions, voicemail, you know, transfers, parking, music on hold, remote extensions, you have a variety of phones. This is just a few of the phones that are available. There's tons of phones, name brands like Polycom, Cisco. Uh, this is the Linksys phone. These two are from Grandstream, the GXP2000 and the, the brand new uh, BT200. So you have a whole range from $85 to $150 to $700 for the new Cisco color touch screen with bang, awesome, cool phone. Polycoms are, are really good in about the $200 price range. So you have some really, really good phones out there that are business class stuff. You, you take a look at these, you know, and you're like, yeah, it's kind of cheesy feeling, they're really lightweight. You know, maybe okay in your house, but would you really want to run a business on a phone that this thing is so light, it just doesn't have the right feel. When you start moving up, and this has a nice heft to it, it's got a good display, it's a much better quality phone. So as you move up in scale, the quality definitely goes up. And soft phones, like I already mentioned, that's just a software phone running on your laptop or a desktop machine. There's a variety of those to choose from. A lot of them are free. There's a few of them that are you know, in the $30 range, $40 range that have video and conference stuff built in and all kinds of additional features, but a basic one that you can get up and running, you can get those for free. Uh, conferences, you know, a lot of companies have to use outside conference systems. Uh, you guys seem old enough to remember the Lions teleconferencing systems and all that stuff. And, and you can do that right in the same PBX system. Set up a complete conference call system, unlimited number of users just based on you know, how many calls are coming in and how much processor you have to deal with. And voicemail, you can have sent directly to your email address. You kind of have that beginning stages of the integrated messaging components that people are really excited about. So you roll all this together, and you can actually offer a phone system that rivals traditional systems such as Strata, Panasonic, Toshiba, for a price point that is next to nothing in comparison. So that's why these things are really taking off <coughs> great, especially in the small business market, where they go in and they want to talk to Toshiba for a 20 station install and it's 20 grand and it's a thousand dollars a seat and it gets really expensive real quick and you don't have half the features that you have in these types of systems where we can go in and sell a system for a third of that with more features. It's, it's a no brainer. But then as you move upscale, the, the gap becomes even more. When we're talking about doing systems with 100, 200 stations, the, the price point can be you know, $30,000, $40,000 in savings to a company. So it makes a lot of sense 
for a company to look at IP-based PPX systems. Now, as I just mentioned, we have name brand phones, Cisco, Linksys, Polycom. They work off standard protocols, which is SIP, and their business quality. This is the, the Linksys phone that I've got up here. Four call appearances, all the hold functions, conferencing, voicemail, soft keys that change based on the what's being displayed, what mode you're in. So these are really good phones. The, some of them have dual Ethernet ports. You come out of the wall, into the phone, out of the phone, into the computer, so you're not eating up another network jack. So you can install these into pre-wired uh, you know, situations where you may not have the ability to add another jack. Um, will the uh, master system integrate into a uh, power over Ethernet uh, system for the bell phones? The asterisk does not care about the switches. So absolutely does not care. And if we look at the, the, the three phones here, two of these support power over Ethernet, one doesn't. So it's, it's a function of the phone itself, the device, not asterisk. It, it doesn't care. So there's, uh, and actually I was going to get on that, like this particular phone, uh, you can see it has the two Ethernet jacks, one in and one out, and this will do power over Ethernet. So there's no configuration change within asterisk. It, it doesn't know the difference whether it's power over Ethernet or not. All it cares about is whether you're using the SIP protocol on a phone that properly implements that and it can talk to it. So in reality, there's probably about a dozen companies out there manufacturing phones and on average they've got four or five models apiece. So there's somewhere around 60 different phones you can choose from today. So you have a wide variety. Although when it really boils down to it in a business environment, you're gonna narrow that down to about three or four phones really quickly. When you're talking about your home, now you've got a whole world of choices. Uh, this Grand Screen GXP 2000 was an extremely popular phone. This was a price point of about $85 for um, multiple call appearances, all these programmable keys. The problem is, you know, we've installed about 200 of these, and every one of them has been sent back. They just, in a business environment, it's just not a very good phone. The speaker phone is horrible. You know, but the price point's good. So if you're playing around, you're experimenting, you're, you know, you're building a little lab so you can start playing around with these types of systems, it's, it's a decent phone because it has all the features. Backlit display. Um, so, I mean, I actually have, I keep this one on my desk. You know, so it's, it's great at home, but in my office, I have a, a much better phone. And then at the low end, these are, you know, in the $70 range, $80 range as well. This one is brand new, this just came out. These just started shipping the, the BT200. Sound quality wise, it's much better than that older GXP. But, um, you know, the display doesn't flip up and the backlight doesn't stay on all the times. There's no multiple call appearances on here. So you really get what you pay for in phones. And in a business environment where they're used to a legacy phone system, those phones are $150, $250 a piece. So to switch them over to IP phones, at $150 to $200, there's no sticker shock there. That, that's what they're used to paying for those. So it, it works out pretty well. Was there, do you have a question? Or are you laughing at someone in IRC? Oh. <laughs> okay, so asterisk is the core of my business. This is what the one that we sell. Uh, we don't sell, it's open source. We consult and we do the installs and configuration, but this is a very short list of the features. Automated attendant, so someone calls in, you get the voice menu, thank you for calling so and so. Yeah? Is anybody me having no trouble reading that? No, probably not. I'm sure everybody is probably. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Do I need to stand in the light so the people on, on the net can see me? So you can read that better now? Yes, I can. Okay. I can work in the dark, so that's cool. Uh, again, this is a very, very short <coughs> list of the features. It's actually about twice, if not three times more than this with an asterisk. From the automated attendant, which is your voice menu when you call in, thank you for calling you know, the company, press one for sales, two for billing, three for support. Uh, blind transferability, call detail records, so you can see all the information about who's called and who's calling out. You can see what your people are doing. Call parking, call queuing. I mean, call queuing is relatively new in the PBX world on any type of system. I mean, we first saw this, you know, 10 years ago at, you know, big companies like Microsoft where it say, you are, you know, caller number 8 million and their estimated hold time is three days. 
Well, we can do that with an asterisk. It's, it's a very simple function. Transferring calls, call waiting, caller ID, so we get the, all the caller ID information coming in. Conference bridging, dial by name, so as you put in people's names within the config files, when someone hits pound to go to the company directory, they can dial by the name and it finds it within the system. There's no extra programming involved to make that happen. The IVR, interactive voice response, that's again that press one for sales, two for billing, and it directs that to either another menu or to a call queue or a ring group and things like that. Local and remote call agents, uh, music on hold, overhead paging. Uh, we can do paging via a sound card in the system, put it out through the console port on there. Or we can you know, hook up a phone as a remote extension that will auto answer. So there's a number, number of different ways to do paging. You know, if another phone is ringing, you can use remote call pickup to answer another phone that's ringing somewhere else. Uh, roaming extensions, that is one of the big selling points of IP PBX systems. I can program this phone with the IP of the PBX system back in the office, and I can plug it in anywhere on the internet, and I've got dial tone. That's fantastic. I mean, people love that. People want to work at home. You know, they want a, a remote office. You have a branch office that doesn't really warrant having its own phone system. Well, you put the main phone system someplace, and you put phones out, out on the net somewhere. And as long as there's decent QoS, you really shouldn't have any issue with that working. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're going to roll out to 66 Carl's Juniors beginning in about two weeks. There's only one asterisk server, but there's 66 locations. So all the phones are going out to the locations, all tied in over the VPN network back to the office. Yes, go ahead. Does music on hold include uh, recorded information uh, for the oh. caller? That was me. No, it wasn't. That was me. <laughs> Projector. Yes. The music on hold works off MP3 files. So you can record them and upload them to the system and put them in the, the music on hold queue and it'll play them in that type of order. So it could be the items on sale today. Absolutely. That's a very popular feature. Um, eHobbies.com, uh, big online hobby store, um, kind of did its partnership with Amazon. Their phone volume just went absolutely through the roof a week before Thanksgiving. And we put that system in there uh, the day before Thanksgiving, knowing the day after Thanksgiving is the busiest day of the year. So it was a little scary trying to throw a system like that together. But what they did is during that, that music on hold, they say, if you visit our website now, use this code and get free shipping. So it all of a sudden, their, the phone. Yeah, their call volume dropped dramatically. And funny, their web orders went up. So you can do things like that to get people off the phone lines and onto an internet site or, you know, or tell them about a special or, you know, different thing. And maybe even give, if it's a tech support line, you know, give the, the current, you know, network status or the, top five tips on how to solve a problem, things like that. I mean, we hear that whenever we call you know, Cox or you know, AT&T, you know, network outage in Southern California right now. So yeah, it's totally easy to do. Um, in fact, you could actually set it up to where, you know, someone has a simple extension that they dial to do that recording and it just drops it into the flow. So it's very flexible in that way. I mean, remember, this is just software. So. Anything that you can imagine doing in software, whether it be a CGI script, a Perl script, a PHP script, a Python, or TCL, or Ruby, or you name it, can drive this system. And it's just script based. So you can get really complicated real easy, or not. It, it really depends on what you really want to do with it. So it's flexible enough to give you that kind of power that you can really customize a situation. So am I like dead in the water? Um, it overheats. Ah, okay. It's Caltech. It overheats. Yeah. Do we need to get like a Caltech kind of person over here to fix that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, I mean, we could pass a rocket lab on the way over here. <laughs> Thank you for just the work. Explains the rocket. Different guys. Different guys, guys specialized. Yeah. <laughs> the guys are still learning those kinds of stuff. Ah, ah. A little super cool. Right, 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 right. You, you want, you want Application or theory? Oh, that's true. Sure. 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 And then there's support. So, well, this is this is a high energy build. 
So all of the theory, this high energy theorists actually are in this building. <laughs> Fourth floor, I think. There we go. Okay, we're back up again. That's why it's so fun. Um, supervised transfer text to speech. Um, <coughs> for the most part, uh, you know, festival is the kind of the default uh, text to speech engine that's in, that's installed. Although you can use things like Flight and a few others. There's some commercial ones that sound really good. So you can do some text to speech stuff. And we've seen, uh, I guess, some really bad examples first. Um, there's a weather script. Dial an extension. It pulls a file from. Um, some weather site, and it says your local temperature is whatever. And personally, I prefer looking out the window versus calling an extension. But whatever, it shows you can do it, and it's, it shows an example of using a text file into a text-to-speech system and seeing how you can do things. Things that we are actually implementing here soon are monitoring systems that actually are actively monitoring our client stations and their networks, their SMTP servers and all that. And when there's a failure, my phone rings and instead of telling me the server's down, I'll just get a message saying, you know, that machine is down. And that way I don't have to actually go back and look and, you know, look it up. It'll actually tell me the, the situation. So there are some interesting things that are being done with text-to-speech. And of course, three-way calling and, and voicemail are uh, given that they can do that. Well, you can do three-way calling by bridging two lines, or you can do things like setting up a conference room, which really has no hard limit, other than the number of channels that are being transcoded at one time, which, you know, depending on your codex and all that, I mean, you could have, you know, 50 people or 200 people, depending on your configuration and, you know, horsepower behind it. But there are some huge systems out there. If anyone's heard of uh, freeconferencecalling.com, uh, you can go to it, set up a free conference call. They use asterisk for that. I mean, and that's a big online conference call system. So you can do a lot of stuff given hardware and codec, you know, tweaking to make it run really good. Okay, one more question. Absolutely. Blind transfer, is that the same thing? Blind transfer. There's two things, uh, blind transfer and, and, and um, what's the other one, attended transfer. Blind transfer is I, I hit a key, hit in your extension, and it just drops the, the call to you. An attended transfer is I dial your extension, you pick it up, I say, John's on the phone, and you say, okay, great. Then I, I hit transfer, and it goes over. So there's unattended versus attended transfer. What, what was the second, your clarification on that? Oh, honey. A hunt group? You're not hunting where you, where you go search for the person. And, and it never, never knows. Okay. Well, we call it as a rank group where we, uh, we can define a number of extensions. And an extension can be a phone. It can be an external phone number, such as a cell phone. And we have multiple different strategies we can use in that ring group. We can say ring all. So if we go to that, it simply does that. It rings them all. We have a hunt group where it will ring one, then ring the other, and then ring the next one. And then we have a, um, another mode where it will ring one, then ring one and two, then ring one, two, and three, one, two, three, and four all at the same time. So there's several different strategies involved in setting up a ring group. And in fact, um, hopefully one of the guys who is listening to this online right now just did a modification to that yesterday where it actually allows a little more functionality in uh, how it handles caller ID functions. So Phil, if you're out there, yeah, good job on that. Um, and then queuing is similar to a ring group in that you, the call goes to the queue, but instead of it simply going out to the group of phones, it puts that person on, on hold while it tries to contact somebody to take that call. So the phones may be ringing, but the, the person who called is sitting listening to music on hold, until an agent picks up the phone, accepts that call, and then that call is routed to that person. So that's kind of the difference between ring groups and, and queues. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that? Guys are too smart or shy or what? We'll keep going. What? Too many people standing at different queues. Ah. That's not true. <laughs> so, 
asterisk is really making inroads. Uh, over the past, like I said, I, I've been using it for about two years now. I've been very impressed with where it was then, and especially where it's going now. The uh, initial people who used it, people like ourselves, you know, the uh, sysadmins, do-it-yourselfers, the IT people who were really interested in new technologies and the things that were coming out and wanted to be on the cutting edge of something really cool. Now, uh, show of hands, how many people read Slashdot on a daily basis? Okay, once a week. Okay, <coughs> that's even more. All right. So, going back almost two years ago now, uh, 19 months, 20 months ago, I, I wrote an article called How to Build Your Own PBX. And it was about using asterisks. Amazing amount of traffic to the, my website. I mean, it's just flashed out effect to the extreme, you know, thousands and thousands of concurrent connections. That's when I started going, oh, hey, maybe I'm onto something here. And then uh, last October, I was asked to do a presentation at AstroCon in Athens, which is a big Astros conference. And I was the third presentation present, presenter in the beginner track. And I listened to the first two, I'm like, Wow, I'm, I'm really going to sound stupid after these guys. I mean, this stuff is really advanced, what they're talking about, and this is the beginner track. And they had about 40 people in each one. And then when I got up to do mine, which is actually based on what's called Asterisk at Home, which is a, a complete distro <coughs> that does everything, complete installation. I mean, it was standing room only. There was almost 200 people there. And that's when I really hit it. That's, okay, wait, I really need to do this as a business. And that's when we started selling the systems. So in the past 18 months, since uh, the time with, that I wrote the first article to now, the, the growth rate has just been exponential. I, where very, very few people have even heard of it or seen it or uh, definitely have not implemented it, now we're seeing it anywhere from tiny, tiny companies to Fortune 500 companies are putting it in in different places. Sometimes it's the voicemail system to a traditional uh, PBX system. Sometimes it's uh, they're using it as a VoIP gateway into their traditional system. So there's a lot of ways to use Asterisk without it being the primary phone system. So we can tie into other types of phone systems, Nortel, Shortel, uh, Cisco, uh, Avaya, Mitel. If they can hook up to the phone to a phone line, we can connect to it and, and do start piecing off parts of that functionality. So as older phone systems, their voicemail systems are beginning to die and they want more functionality, we can push asterisk into the mix and give them voicemail to email capabilities. We can uh, put it in the mix and have certain extensions or certain phone numbers routed to the asterisk box for overseas calls using internet telephone service providers. We can do all kinds of interesting things with it. Uh, we're actually working on a project right now where they have 21 locations around the globe and each one has its own phone system, and the, no two of them are alike. But we're going to put an asterisk box at each location, tied into those systems, which then all mesh back together. So that as they make a call from here to Hong Kong, it goes out over their VPN connection instead of their telco connection, saving them probably in the, in the, the range of $10,000 a month. So this will pay for itself in a matter of months. So. It's, it's a lot more than just a phone system. It is a toolkit to do telephony applications. So it, it's a matter of how you look at it. Even though Digium says it's asterisk PBX, it's a whole lot more than that. It's, it really is a toolkit to enable you to do some really exciting things. As I mentioned, I mentioned some of our, our clients before. eHobbies.com, Chromax, Cortex. You'll know Cortex soon enough. Just trust me on this. Wireless video from your laptop to a projector, your TV, amazing. Coming out soon. Uh, Genius Products, the division of Merrimax Film, Carl's Jr., Auto Centro, 75 car dealerships all tied together. Some really cool things that we can do that there really is no other way of doing without tools like Asterisk and IP based PBX systems. I guess I just said that, huh? Uh, more than just the PBX, uh, connect to existing <coughs> systems, legacy systems or avoid capabilities, used to tie multiple offices and locations together, and it can be used as a conference bridge. So I, I've already mentioned a lot of these things in passing already. Uh, the voicemail system, uh, VoIP capabilities, uh, 
conference bridging, you know, so instead of paying the telco for the conference system, you can just throw in an asterisk box. So how do we manage it? And uh, people like Mitch here, you know, uh, he likes config files. I don't. I'm a GUI guy. Oh, I might sound right, but I like it to be simple. I like it to be easy. I like it to be functional. I like to be able to train uh, more lesser skilled people to manage it, maintain it. So I've been a, a big supporter of the different web GUIs that are out there. Uh, Druid, beautiful interface, kind of lacking in functionality at the moment. They're moving up fast. Free PBX, absolutely my, my favorite right now from a functionality point of view, just not very pretty, uh, kind of buggy, got some issues, but making a lot of progress on it. Third lane, another one, very good commercial product. Uh, probably over the next year, this list will be three times as long. And it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, Digim has something or buy, buy somebody or do something and come up with something that really blows all the rest of these out of the water. People in the, the enterprise environment want something that they can manage or that their IT people can manage without having to call in the phone guy to come in and manage phones and extensions. That's been the biggest reason a lot of the companies that we've dealt with have switched. You have a Toshiba system and you need to add an extension, it's $250 an hour to have someone come out and do five minutes worth of work. We can show them how to do that using a web interface in two minutes time and they can do it themselves. So they don't have to call us for five minutes worth of work. Or if they do want us to do it, we can do it remotely because it's web based. You know, we can get into their network and set it up and not even have to pay a visit to them. Saving a company tons and tons of money over the long haul by not having to fork out so much money to the traditional phone guys. Though we mentioned free PBX, uh, by far the most popular open source web interface. Those are the people, uh, we invited them to, to kind of join and listen in. Are, is anyone watching, Mitch? Uh, oh, uh, oh, the account? Like, I can't see Well, no, that. I mean, uh, are, you, are you chatting with them right now? Well, I can't I can get to it because I use Windows and no one here cares about that. God, yeah. <laughs> um, isn't that like blasphemy in this room? Yeah, I'm not going to install it. It's a deal. Are you doing more? I did. Um, there's a lot of community development going on with free PBX. Uh, I've contributed code. I know a lot of other people who have contributed code. It, because it really is a, a good interface for it. it, it does a lot of things. And granted, all it's doing is writing config files. It, it stores its data in a MySQL database, and then when you apply your changes, it, it recreates the config files. So it's not doing anything that you couldn't do by hand. And in some ways, it's limiting you because you can't really do custom stuff for each person. You, you have to work within the confines of the interface, even though nowadays, because it's, it's very modular, the way they've designed it, so people are writing the modules all the time to enhance it, even though a lot of the functionality that people have wanted has, has been added or is being added right now, you're still limited in exactly what you want to do sometimes. You can still go and, and edit config files, you just have to be careful that you're not overwriting the different settings. Yeah? Does this still have a lap stack? I'm sorry, what? Does this still have a lap stack? Do you ask you all kind of stack? Yes. Or? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, so it needs a web browser and yeah. all the usual stuff on Okay. Exactly. Uh, your, your basic, well, MySQL is the only database supported by FreePBX. Uh, Druid, I think, is Postgres. And so depending on which one, but FreePBX is MySQL and Apache. Lost my train of thought there. Uh, oh, tons of features, and I put features in quotes as I was just saying, because it doesn't add anything to asterisk that you can't do by hand. If you know how to do it within a config file, you can do it in a config file. So even though you know free PBX talks about how many features it has, it's just making it easier to implement things that you could already do if you wanted to do it manually with the config files. Some people are actually fairly quick at doing it with config files once you know the, the syntax and everything. But still, from a maintenance point of view, it's to have something that's very specific and really you don't go outside that box is probably a lot better for most businesses, kind of keeps them from getting into too much trouble. You know, if you can't go outside the interface, it's a lot easier to maintain. 
So as I mentioned, it's front-end modules that create the custom dial plans, the following functions, ring groups, call queues, text-to-speech, all the other features that we've kind of mentioned are individual modules within the system that have been created. We're actually going to look at the free PBX interface and, and get a kind of a feel for exactly what it does in um, just a few minutes. But we'll kind of keep going here. So Trixbox, an asterisk at home, as I mentioned before, is a complete ISO distro. You download it, burn the ISO image, boot it up off your computer, preferably one that you really don't want any data off of because it will wipe the hard drives. And it installs CentOS 4.3, Asterisk, PPVX, MySQL, Flash Operator Panel, the Call Data Reports, the Weather Script, the Wake Up Script, Billing Stuff, uh, Group Speed Dial, a bunch of stuff that you may never use. So it's actually probably overkill for most people, but the fact is from the time you, you boot off that, uh, that ISO image to the time that you can actually have two phones talking to each other and dialing out, you can do it under an hour. So, and even faster on a really fast machine. I mean, my record was last week, I had a super powerful box that we did it on, and I had the entire system up and running in, in about 45 minutes. I mean, and it's mostly automated. It's, okay, tap, tap, come back in 20 minutes as it's compiling. Uh, it's, it's a very fast install. So, if, if you want to look at Asterisk and play around with it and get a feel for it, this is a good way of doing it, just because you can get it up and running without having to go through you know, installing Linux and installing MySQL and installing Apache, it does it all with the right permissions and the right user groups and all that, so it, it's up and running properly. If you're a purist, like some people in the room, won't mention any names, like Mitch, <laughs> you know, it, it's not for him and it's not for everybody. It, it's a, a, you know, a specific type of people that are going to want this. I use it. Now, I build systems off of this. It, I can't, you can do it. Uh, but, like I said, it's not for everybody. But we're going to look at it anyway, just because I do recommend it as a starting point to start playing around with the system. And really, to get started, get a 300 megahertz machine out of your garage. And I'm sure most of you have spare machines laying around in your garage, because I know I do. Garages are Okay, spare bedrooms. Spare bedrooms, living rooms, dining rooms, your car, whatever, under your bed. Hopefully not under your covers, you know, but I'll leave that to you. Uh, but it is a great way of getting started. And I'm, I'm going to hype on this a little bit more because I actually have a book coming out on this soon. So watch for that in a couple months. But, and it's not out yet, so I'm not going to give you a link to it. Sorry. And there's a few resource sites to take a look at. Asterisk.org is the main site for Asterisk. Tricksbox.org. Uh, VoipSpeak.net is my website where I've got product reviews, tutorials, news, information, uh, forum, and stuff. Uh, NerdViddles.com, run by a friend of mine, Ward, uh, back east. Uh, again, lots of tutorials, very specific to Trixbox. Uh, so if you're playing around with Trixbox and you want to see how to do some really custom scripts, some auto dialers, and things like that, NerdViddles is a, a great place to go. And VoipInfo.org is the main wiki site for Asterisk. So these are ones you definitely want to write down and, and take a look at. So that's the end of the slides. So what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and boot up a copy of Trixbox that we have running on here. No, it does not run under Windows. So obviously I am a Windows user, heaven forbid, but uh, I do like the VMware player. It allows me to run through different configurations. I can actually sit and do all my uh, IVR programming for a client while I'm on the road, copy the scripts over, get their system up and running in no time. Uh, some of the, the IVR menus we've done have been extremely complex. I mean, they've taken you know, 40 plus hours to code just the IVR menus. Uh, so people do some pretty crazy things with it. And doing it in a virtual machine, once I have it done, I can just wipe it and start over. So I, 
if you're a Windows person, I kind of like this. It's a great way of getting your system up and running. Any questions so far on anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, on the uh, more complex uh, Cisco and Linksys phones where, where you download a, a personality to a phone or you tap it or, or you need to uh, download uh, operating system updates for the phone via TFTP, mm -hmm. um, how does us about stuff like that? It's great, actually. Again, that type of stuff is not a functionality of asterisk as much as it is a functionality of the phone. So each of these phones, in fact, every phone I've used so, to date so far can pull config files off of TFTP. Some of them uh, can do HTTP, some of them can do FTP, but they'll all do TFTP. And actually, I was going to point to the screen, but there ain't nothing there. Uh, with Trixbox, it actually has a TFTP server built into it, so you can okay. point, the, point them right there. There's some tools coming out to actually have a web interface to develop uh, the config files for the phones. There's already one for the, the Cisco 79 series uh, phones. The next one is going to be, uh, I believe, the Grand Screams, I don't know why, the uh, Polycoms, and then uh, the Linksys phones that people are working on. So people are coming out with those endpoint managers that plug into the Trixbox system, or uh, down the road we're going to see that within free PBX itself to help you to build those config files. And then copy them to the TFTP server, and maybe you're using DHCP with option 66 to say, there's the box, and power up the phones, and we do the config files the same as doing the firmware updates. Just whatever that phone wants and how you put it there, they work just fine. Do you say it doesn't run on Windows, does it run on Mac? Yes. Yes, it can. It'll run on OS X. Absolutely. Um, there's some great uh, resources on how to do that on VoIPinfo.org. The only problem is, running it under that, they don't have drivers for some of the cards right now. So if you want to use one of the internal cards for connecting to a T1 line or the, an analog line, for example, you're kind of out of luck right now. You have to use an external device to come in. But I'm sure that's going to be solved here short term. But as far as getting it up and running in a pure VoIP environment, absolutely. Lots of people do it. Did you have a question? Did someone? I thought I saw another hand go somewhere. Because I have to pay to make up time while the thing pulls down. Well, one thing I didn't understand was you said that this, these things that we downloaded to the phones would work with the trace box, but not with free PDX, which is well, part of the trace box. So I, let me kind of clarify. Free PBX has no interface to configure the device itself, nor an interface to create the config files for the phones today. There is an endpoint manager as part of Trixbox that will do the Cisco config files. Which is just a copy. Um, yeah, it, it basically takes a template, says, okay, what extension do you want for it? Boom, it pops out the MAC address file. And it's actually really simple. Once you have a config file that you like for any given phone, there's only three settings you have to change. The, the login, the password, and the SIP proxy server. So once you have a config file that works, anybody can write a, well, maybe anybody, but probably everybody in this room can write a script that can generate files based on only changing those three variables. So it's not a big deal once you have a config file that works. Come on, I know you might have a question there first. No? Oh, okay. Sorry. It's okay. You can scratch. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, anyone else? Oh, we're back up. Okay. <clears throat> you know what? I need to clarify one more thing. Sure. So instead of trace box, you really could just use that with Astro because it's the key ingredient to. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, come on. Trick spots. Uh, yeah, exactly. 
So we'll go and do the uh, system administration, where we have the, uh, the endpoint manager, which again is only uh, Cisco right now. The HUD manager, which is the heads up display, which is from Finality, it's not GPL, so I don't talk about it. Uh, config edit, so you, uh, it's a real simple editor, so you can actually edit the config files themselves if you need to get to them, and free PBX. Um, if anyone noticed, this also has uh, PHP MyAdmin, uh, uh, SSH terminal client, and uh, unit in it, which is kind of cool. But here's free PBX. When uh, first time you run it, that's really all you see. And you have to go to the tools and go to the module admin and then download whatever modules you want for it. So there's an online repository for all the modules that come out. If we look at the, uh, the base setup here, so we can set up a callback function. You dial in, hit a key, it hangs up, calls you back, and then does something. So uh, a lot of people use this as a way to uh, get into the voicemail system so that it's calling you back. Or if you have free inbound calls to your cell phone, call your phone system, it hangs up, it calls you back, so you have free incoming calls, gives you dial tone, so now you can dial out anywhere you want and you're not sucking up minutes on your cell phone. Yeah, see, you people got that one. I knew something here was gonna impress people. So that, that's, that's a cool little hack right there. So. Free inbound calls, there's the ticket. I have T-Mobile, so I'm not can't hit, do that yet. But that's a great feature. Conferences, again, I, I, I've mentioned conferences again because I, I think this is just a really cool system the way they've done it now. It, it really does work the way you would expect a conference system to work. You, know, you, you, know, you can set pins for the users, a, a pin for the admin, a join message, wait for the leader to join, you know, quiet mode, user count, user going to leave. Music on hold while the leader's not in. You know, you can have a menu function so you can get to an IVR menu from within it. So everything that you would expect from you know a professional quality enterprise price class uh, conference system, you can do right here within free PBX. Uh, DISA uh, is direct inward system access, which again can do the same functionality I've already described. You can dial in, you get into the system. So basically getting dial tone back, you can traverse the system, you can dial, dial out as if you were an extension on the system. So where, where might you use something like this? Well, I, a year ago, this week, my wife had gallbladder surgery and the hospital only allowed local phone calls. But she wanted to call her family, which of course is nowhere near local. So she would call into the local, uh, into our PBX, which was local, get dial tone and then be able to dial long distance to talk to her family while she was in the hospital. So it's a great use of that, that type of feature. There, there's a lot of other reasons why you might, but that, that actually is a, a really good one. The digital receptionist is pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, and I know a lot of companies, you know, really switched over quick when that came out and, you know, got rid of the receptionists and said, oh, we want the system to take all the phone calls and then there was kind of a resurgence to go back to a live person and now the technology is kind of catching up. They're starting to move back into the digital receptionists again. So we're kind of seeing that trend switch back and the functionality within free PBX that allows us to set that up is actually pretty cool. So we can enable the directory so they hit pound. It says, you know, you're in the company directory. You can dial, dial by first or last name. Uh, Direct dial to extensions. Is it announced? You want an announcement to, to come on first? You know, press one for sales, two for billing, and then we say what extension, what number do we want to dial, and where do we want it to go? And if we had more of these other functions set up, the options here grow in accordance to whatever other conditions we have set up. So we may have miscellaneous routes or uh, ex other extensions or ring groups, and if all those were set up, we have a lot more options to do. So when you're programming your IVR, you have to do it backwards. You know, you start at the end point and then move back towards the main menu because you have to have all the other pieces there first. So you have to think backwards when you do it. Define setup there. What? Define setup. Setup? Yeah, what did you mean that you had to set up these things? Is that installing modules or is that, is that getting oh, back to doing the like if, if I wanted to hit five to go to a ring group, I would have to define the ring group first before I have that as an option here. But you're saying that this is, now you're saying that's in the GUI though. 
Yeah, we're, we're just looking at the free PBX GUI. If you're doing it with config files, go but, for it. But are you saying, when you say you have to work backwards, did you mean that this is you're talking about a procedure that you have how you would use the GUI? Yes. Oh. Well, it actually, in, in essence, you would do it in a config file as well, because you, you're going to define those destinations first. And you're going to lay it out in a flowchart, probably, if it's complicated, so you know exactly where you're going to go, and you can start coding it any way you want. You know, within this GUI, you have to think backwards and do your endpoints, and then work back from there. It's like defining a variable before you use it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see the ring group unless I define the ring group. It's pretty simple. And with extensions, we've got different types of extensions. SIP, again, it's a standard SIP device or soft phone. Uh, IAX or EX, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, there are some uh, the hard devices that use that. There's most uh, some, some of the better soft phones use that. And that protocol traverses NAT much better than SIP. So it's a good choice for people who are on the road. ZAP is the phone system, the kind of PSTN connections. Uh, those are referred to as ZAP channels. Or custom, which can be uh, you know, custom defined. It can be all kinds of different things. Uh, I can set up a custom dial string to dial my cell phone. And I, do all kinds of different things. When we look at an extension, you know, and again, this being the GUI, you do have all these options within the config files. You just have to know exactly how to, to set them up. And so we're just kind of cheating by showing this. But I do expect a lot of people are going to play around with free PBX first, you know, and get a feel for how all the pieces kind of come together. And you may stick with it. You may not. You know, like I said, it's not for everybody, but. For those of us who, you know, want to get a system up and running faster without having to delve into, you know, a big book on asterisk, which I, I should mention, there there is a book, Asterisk, The Future of Telephony. Do a search on Google for that. It's a free PDF download. Or you can go buy the, the hard copy books. It, it's what? Someone asked, would you say Trixbox is like asterisk for dummies? Yes, I would. I, I actually would. Because to get Trixbox up and running requires virtually no Linux skills or telephony knowledge. However, to build a production system and maintain it properly, you're going to know or have to know Linux and telephony. So yeah, it's a great way of getting in and learning it and playing around with it, but don't expect that you know, you'll put this up tomorrow, get a soft phone working and be able to go out and sell you know, 100 station installs because there's a lot more to it than just what you can do, you know, by slapping in an ISO image and getting going. So, uh, but it's not that bad. And considering I'm talking at a Linux users group, I'm guessing you guys probably know Linux. It's just a guess. I mean, so um, it's probably not a big stretch for you to do, you know, RPMs, for example, you know, things like that. So, uh, I don't see that as being a big stretch. You, know? you, you might even know things like BI. Just guessing. Um, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Just keep dusting down, man. You know, Nano. Yeah, baby. Seco. I'm there. You know, uh, you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hard con convert to those. I mean, I, I, I can use BI, but, you know, I, I'm so lazy, it's just not even funny. So. Uh, it's not a skill thing, it's pure and simple laziness. That's all there is to it. I'll admit that right up front. Uh, or back to extensions, that's what we're talking about. Um, when, when you set up an extension, you can have it have a direct uh, DID, which is uh, direct inward dial. So everyone can have it. If, if you have multiple phone numbers coming into your, your system, everyone can be assigned their own phone number. I mean, we see that in higher end systems already. Uh, it's very simple to implement here. Uh, DID alert info, so you can have uh, your, uh, what is that, your, uh, the different dial tones or different ring patterns based on who's calling you. Uh, you can set up emergency CIDs. Uh, you can record the calls incoming and outgoing. 
which you just have to be careful about that because Asterisk does not send out a tone on a regular basis. So in California, which is all I'm going to talk about, uh, you have to tell the people that you're going to record their calls uh, if you ever want to use it against them, anyway. Uh, but it's all built in, and there's a whole interface that you can use if you so desire to listen to those and play them back and uh, keep track of them. What's the DID alert info to? There you go, read it. It's for setting up distinctive ring based on caller ID. So if the phone happens to support distinctive ring, which the grand streams don't, but the Linksys does, then you could say, you know, if it's set, then uh, you know, use that. But I get it. it doesn't work on all phones at this point. That's, that's not really a, uh, a standard thing that's in all. That's one thing you'll find when you're looking at different phones is there is no standardization at all today. I mean, some phones will support things one way, and others will do something different. Of the five major phones that are in use today, they all do paging differently, for example. It's one, one has a, a space where the other has a backslash. And it, so there, there's little nuances with each phone that you have to get used to. So right now, there, there's that kind of whole issue of standardization on a lot of the things. And I, I expect that's going to change over time and probably not quickly because your big guys like Cisco and Linksys are going to try and push the smaller guys like Grandstream and Snome and try and get their standard in place versus the others. I mean, that's the way it always works. So. I expect that to go on for a long time. And yet, Linksys has actually been pretty good about uh, trying to be flexible with the whole thing, because they kind of missed the boat early on when they have their own little IP PBX system that's about that big, called the SPA 9000. It supports four to 16 extensions, and it's, it's an interesting little box. I'm not gonna bash it too bad. Um, but it's an interesting box, and they thought that that, with their phone, was just going to take over the world. And when they, I, they invited me to take a look at the phone before they shipped it, I said, that's going to be the number one selling phone next year. And this was about a year ago. And sure enough, it, it is the number one selling phone, but not with their phone system. You know? <laughs> Go figure. You know? But all the people who support uh, asterisk, uh, voidlink.com, voidsupply.com, ata.com, uh, all these guys who are, are the resellers of these equipment, they cannot keep this phone in stock. It's a very popular phone with asterisk. So uh, they kind of caught on to that real quick that, well, wait a minute, we're selling way more phones than we are phone systems. <laughs> Something's not adding up here. And now they're trying to work with Digium to become Linux certified and make whatever changes they need to. So. They saw, they saw it pretty quick. So unlike you know Cisco, who's just like, nope, don't want to talk to you about it. Uh, Linksys has actually been fairly responsive in trying to come up to speed with what's going on with Asterisk and hopefully trying to to work with everybody. I know they've been really good with me as far as uh, you know some of the articles that I've written and making sure that we figure out how to do different things. So are they the cool on the coolest factor or are they number one? I, I'm not going to say yes to that. Uh, from from a, a cool company point of view, with most people, I, I would say probably not. They're, they're up there, but probably not. With me, I have an excellent relationship with them. I've been working with them for a long time. I write product reviews for them. I, I've been completely honest in my reviews of their phones. And when uh, I reviewed the, the first model of this, which was the 941, it didn't have a backlit display. You know, I'm like, in my article, I said, you guys have a $150 phone without a backlit display, and I can buy an $85 one with a display so bright I have to turn it off because it lights up my room at night. You know? And I don't know about you guys, but I kind of work in the dark for the most part. You know, I keep the lights down dim, so I, I'm working on the screen all day. I can't see the phone. And when the phone call comes in, I can't see who's on it. And to me, that was a major setback with their phone. Well, the 942s were getting ready to come out just at the time that my article hit, and they gave me a call. They said, you know, because of you, we're delaying it so we can put a backlight on the phones. I'm like, okay. I said, no, no, just wait until I bash on the next version. Okay, because the next version, you know, okay, great, that was great for the phone, it got backlit, but when I reviewed this phone, I said, there's not enough soft keys. 
you know, now that has become the big issue. People want, guess what? They want, again, back to this phone. They want a bunch of programmable keys where I can program this to different extensions within my office and see who's on the phone or not. I can see their call status. I can't do it with only four lines. So, you know, I was nice at first, but then I hit them again. And so they said, hey, we have a solution coming out. So they're going to have a, uh, uh, what's called a sidecar, which will plug into this and give you a line of extensions on it. At least the sidecar will support it. Because Cisco's sidecars have been available for a while, you just run some protocols. That's correct. That's correct. And all the all of the Linksys products are SIP only. So. Do you use the Polycom sidecars? No, I don't. I didn't really like them. Uh, they were just I had issues with them in the past. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I had a couple clients try them out. They didn't like them. And uh, if we needed to go into a sidecar scenario, we were, uh, we've been using the Snome 360 with their sidecar, and they've been really happy with those. And it's a much less expensive phone. Um, and the quality is still pretty decent for a receptionist phone. Uh, the Grand Streams, uh, the phone here, the Grand Stream, yeah, cheap phone, but they have a huge sidecar, and you can expand it out to like 96 extensions, and you know it's crazy. They're trying. I'll give them credit for trying, but um, it, it still is kind of problematic in that, in that area. So, uh, but from a cool point of view that Linksys is trying, I, I'll give them credit for that. Grandstream, they try. I'm just not sure they try hard enough. Uh, buggy firmware, they'll come up with a new one and it adds echo and it come up with something else and it fixes the echo but it, it kills the side tone. I mean, it's been very problematic even though they, they've kind of been trying. So if there's one that really, I guess, stands out more than the rest, I'd probably have to say it was Linksys just by default. But um, So their idea is that nobody's really being yet because they're afraid. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a shame right now. So I, I still think the big companies like that are really missing the boat. Uh, Polycoms, I love their phones. I mean, anyone who's ever used a Polycom phone, regardless of whether it was SIP or analog, they are awesome phones. I mean, the sound quality cannot be touched by anybody out there. Their speaker phones, hands down, the best out there. As far as Ash was concerned, they could drop off the face of the planet tomorrow. Absolutely don't care. You know, you get zero support from them. It works, it works fine, but they just don't really see that as a market that they're in. And it, it, again, that matters somehow? what? That matters somehow? Uh, I don't know that it matters to to an extent. As long as as long as we have workarounds to make their phones work with our systems, I guess that really is all that matters in the end. But it would be nice if they improved some of the things to work better with Asterisk. Things like adding the the BLF function at the cheap $85 phone has and backlit displays and things that people have really asked for just in general, let alone anything that's asterisk specific. So uh, great phones, but they don't really listen to what people are really, you know, wanting these days. Awesome sound quality, great. That's their thing, you know. Lots and lots of features, not so great quality, that's their thing, you know. So. It, there's pros and cons to all of them, you know. Um, you know, and I, I, could, I could go on and on about all the different brands, Astron, Snome, and all those. But uh, you know, it, your best just to do some research, try out some phones if you're if you're going to look at them. It, it boils down to me. I'll use the Linksys or the Polycoms, and that's, that's pretty much it. And I know my clients are going to be happy with it. Uh, you know, after you see 200 of these things get sent back because they're so bad, you go, okay, <laughs> I'm only going to sell good phones from now on. Uh, is there a question in the back? What's BLF? BLF is a uh, blind line function. That's what I mentioned where you can uh, set this to someone's extension and when they're on the phone you'll see the light. When there's phones ringing you'll see a flash. Uh, so it's being able to see the, the remote line status blindly. You know, I don't have to actually look at their phone. I can see it from here. I can see what's going on. Which is a function of traditional PBX systems for years. Usable if you like actually walk into the other person's office instead of calling them. <laughs> well, I always do that. I like hit there. Yeah. Yeah. What is the asterisk PDX system cost? I mean, just 
like a, well, let's say just a server or EDX. Again, it's open source software, so what is your hardware? I mean, that's <coughs> it's hardware and labor is what it boils down to. Finality is selling one under a thousand or nine something. Yes, yes they are, which is surprising that they're doing it that way. And it is asterisk based. It's off a, actually a fairly old version of asterisk now, so it's kind of limited in features. It, it's their own web interface. Uh, when you make a change, you're actually making a change on their web servers, which stores the configuration there and then pushes it out to your box so that should your box die, they can just push out a new config file to you and get you back up and running. So there, there are some benefits to it. And Finality wins a number of deals in the, the very small business market, up to about 10 to 12 users. Above that, people want the other functionality that Astros provides that is not capable of being done with the, within the Finality interface. But, um, you know, and they got a bunch of money for funding. You know, I sit in on the calls every once in a while, just kind of get caught up with what they're doing. And, you know, as of like two months ago, they had sold 800 systems. Which to me, I'm like, you guys got five million in funding, and you know you got eight thousand resellers, and you've sold eight hundred systems. That doesn't seem like it's working too well, you know. Um, but it's a niche market. I mean, they have de they've defined this is our niche, and that's what we're going to go for. And I think over time that will probably ramp up again. But you're seeing a lot of just gen general IT guys, wiring guys, other people out there you know, becoming finality resellers so that they can try and edge their way into the, the telephone space. Uh, as an IT guy myself, you know, that always bugged me, you know. I, I'm sitting there, you know, working on the network for a company and yet they've got a simple problem with their phone, they've got to call someone else. So I could never really be that one-stop IT shop for my clients unless I became Panasonic certified or Toshiba certified or Mitel certified, you know, all the other brands that are out there. But Astros gives me that ability to get in the door, sell the system to them, sell the service on top of it, and I'm giving them a bargain with more features than they could get from anyone else. So it is a win-win in my book, and it, it's a, a good sell too. I say, look, it's a computer. It runs on Ethernet. That means it's mine. Go away. You know, it's my domain when it's on the Ethernet and it's a computer. And you know, and it's true. Right? That's how we're we're getting in the door. And feature wise, they can't compete. And cost wise, they can't compete. You know, how many phones do you want? Do the math. You know, what's the cost of a of a really high end killer server these days? A grand. You know, open source software. Now you're talking labor. You know. And depending on the complexity, you now I mean, to hire a consultant to come in and set it up, do the programming, set all this stuff up, uh, connect all the phone circuits and all that. Yeah, you're probably going to be in for a few thousand dollars here or there, depending on the complexity of your system. But it's still far cheaper than any other system out there. Yeah. I think the answer to the question is traditional PBS is typically run about a thousand dollars per station. A thousand per station, yeah. And VoIP systems right now are running between five and eight hundred dollars a station on average. So. That's an all-in cost, so you kind of make an approximation. Right. That includes the phone, right? That includes the phone. That includes the phone. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, <coughs> virtually any other system that's out there, if you want to add an extension, you have to buy another license. You know, you want to add ring groups, you're buying a piece of hardware or another license, and you want to add another feature, it's another license. And, you know, you, you kind of get licensed to death with a lot of the systems, but here, once you have it, there. There's, there's no limits. There's no extension limits. There's no user licenses. It's, it's all there. So especially in the long run, or more especially in a growth potential, you can't beat the price. Yeah? Yeah, this is kind of a newbie question, but can you, uh, can you upgrade asterisk on the fly without interrupting service? No. No. However. Just like updating any software. How, however, the, the update time is extremely short. You can recompile and get it all ready to go and then do a stop and start and have it back up and running in literally seconds. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's very quick. So you don't have to shut it down to do your rebuild. 
you can sit there and do your rebuild and then shut it down and bring it back up. So we can do an upgrade and you know actually watch the, the call volume and as soon as it stops, we do a stop and start and we're back up and they, they never knew they were ever down. So, I mean, of course we schedule it, but in the back, you or you've been trying. Um, I'm totally not knowledgeable about the X. Um, so well, as a, there's no stupid questions, only stupid people. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I see this uh, internet cloud and asterisks in the middle there, and having these network phones plug into it, finding them. But the part that eludes me is saying at home and I want to try this out. How do I connect that to something? Uh, SDC, you know, okay. to the top e Excellent question. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Right. Number, well, first off, is your wife really patient with you? If not, you probably don't want to use the phone lines. Okay, so that, there's, there's one. Okay, it's very difficult to pass the wife test with a, one of these systems at home when you're testing it. So, uh, what a lot of people do is they'll get what we call an ITSP, an Internet Telephone Service Provider. And you can get the you know ten dollars a month or you know one and a half cents a minute and you know put twenty bucks on it the last few months while you sit there and learn the ins and outs of the system and then all your calls inbound and outbound are simply going out over your your internet connection you have no connection to the actual phone company other than the internet telephone service providers uh, Teleax is a good one um, uh, Vitality is a good one Broad Voice and, and, you know. Uh, you know, there, there's like hundreds of them out there. At last count, there was over 2,000 in the country. You know, it's, it's not hard to find. The, the best thing to do would be, you know, post in a forum, get on the, you know, maybe uh, one of the IRC channels, Asterisk or Free PBX, and, and ask, you know, what people are recommending. You'll get some links. Uh, I use Vitality myself, and, uh, you know, it's like 1.39 cents a minute, and it's been really reliable for me. Uh, I have my 888 number through there. I have 888 IU VoIP. I don't know how I managed to steal that, but you know, and <laughs> that's like two cents a minute for the, my toll-free number and things like that. Now, when you want to go to the next step and you want to connect to the a traditional phone line or POTS line or PSTN line, there's a couple different ways of doing it. Digium has a card. Uh, you can go up to four analog lines on the card. Yeah, it's the TDM 400. You get modules that plug on there, plug your phone lines right into the back, tell the system I've got that many number of channels and now you're on the phone system. Uh, they have a, a bigger card, a full size card, that can go up to 24 analog lines. There's small devices. Uh, Linksys has one of my favorites. It's called the SPA 3000. And it's about a little bit bigger than a, like two decks of cards and runs about $89 and it's a single port uh, phone line adapter. So it's it's phone in and voice over IP out. So connect it in and it comes in as a SIP trunk into Asterisk. That is a wonderful device. Um, the new version of that is the SPA3102, which does all that and is a full router with QoS and everything in it for the same price. So uh, it's really cool little devices. Coming out in uh, What's the, name of that? the SPA3102 from Linksys. It's a good, good point. Um, coming out from Linksys in, I'm guessing about a month because the betas just went out uh, yesterday, is called the SPA 400, which is a four port analog to SIP convert with actually a voicemail server on it if you're running their phone system. But uh, and with Asterisk, it's going to be a four port analog to, uh, to SIP. And that is expected to be in the $200 to $250 price range. Then there's bigger, there's channel banks that will bring it in as a T1 connection and all kinds of stuff. And those are going to be in the $2,000 price range. So anything from one up is, is kind of the limit. Now, if you start doing research, and now I'm going to give my little disclaimer here, you'll see people talking about the X100P card. Okay. Digium used to have what they call the X100P, which is just a single port uh, PCI card. They got rid of it because of the pile of junk. All it is is a generic Intel Win mode. 
never designed to do voice applications. Pick them up on eBay for six bucks, pop it in, you can work. I've done it, it works, the sound quality is bad, they have interrupt problems, you'll get choppy sound, you'll have numerous problems. So all the people that I know who have actually done it on a regular basis, you'll find one card that works great, one card that doesn't, and you'll spend it days trying to figure out why and it's just a bad part. So I personally recommend don't going down that route, even though it's tempting because you can get the cards for 10 bucks. It, it's often a lot more hassle than it's worth. So what about the better quality modems? No. Uh, the Intel Win Modem generic clone is really the only one that's that's known to work. Uh, if, if you're gonna go for it, you know go for it. Spend the 89 bucks for the, the single port adapter and then you're not going to have the call quality issue. That was the, the single point was the SGA 3102? The, three, the 3000 or the 3102. Oh. The 3102 has the router built in, the 3000 doesn't. That's the only difference. Uh, now a point that Mitch brought up is, uh, especially when we're talking about these internet telephone service providers, is 911 service. You know, how do you dial 911 if your calls are just blasting out over the internet somewhere? Well, uh, some of the providers provide the E911 service. You have to go in, you set it up, and say, if a call comes in from my line, here's my address and all that, which is great if you never leave your house. You know, not so good if you've got remote extensions all over the place and who knows where the call's coming from. So that is a problem that we still face today in how to deal with 911. With this Linksys device, the, three, the 3000 or the 3102, it has a mode where uh, you can set a dial plan. So if you dial 911, instead of sending it out there, it'll send it back out to the phone line and redirect it. So if you're, you're doing these hybrid systems that are a combination of, of phone lines and voice over IP, we always want to keep those phone lines there for doing the 911 service. It just makes a lot of sense that way. Uh, but it is something to think about, especially in a production rollout. You have to take that into consideration. Other questions? So in terms of scaling of the hardware, mm -hmm. what kind of server for different size jobs are you looking at? Uh, I, I've yet to, to really tax a machine, even at 100 extensions, because it's not the number of extensions, it's the number of concurrent calls that really uh, racks on a system. And typically, you run uh, Twenty-five percent of the number of extensions is how many phone lines you need. So if you have a hundred extensions, you're probably going to need twenty-five uh, phone lines coming in. And twenty-five phone lines coming into a, you know, your typical P4 system, it's going to be running two percent utilization. You know, what will eat it up is conferences where you have people coming in over different mediums. You have these people coming in over SIP, and these guys are coming in over analog, and you know other types of things where it has to do the transcoding for everybody. That's where you'll see a lot of CPU eating up. But if you're not using that functionality, you can scale up pretty high, but you do have problems going really wide with it today. And it's all being worked on right now, but uh, you know we have seen systems that have 10,000 users on them spread across multiple machines. So you, there are ways of doing it. There just isn't, you know, like super cool whiz bang clustering solutions quite yet. Although that's coming, but it, it'll scale up pretty nicely. Uh, you know, our, one of our largest installs, pushing about 90 extensions right now, is running on a uh, three gigahertz machine with a gig of RAM, and the thing is just like idle. And it's just not even being touched at all. One one CPU. Yeah, single CPU on it. Uh, now, granted, that that has a uh, PRI uh, T1 voice coming into it, which actually is uh, pretty easy on the system, uh, all things considered. So that that box is just stone cold. I mean, it just doesn't. It's not doing anything. Uh, Making like a game server, I guess. What do you do? <laughs> what do you do for power outages in your system? Lots of yeah. batteries. Lots of batteries or UPSs? UPSs, yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, being you know, CentOS, there's things like the APC modules that you can get to do a clean shutdown and, and all that. Um, well, I was going to say, fortunately, we haven't seen a lot of power outages lately 
until this summer, you know, which has just been absolutely brutal. I've never seen so many power outages before. And uh, fortunately, we, have, we haven't had a system go down, uh, even though a couple of them got hit. But uh, they just, I mean, they had an hour of backup time on them, and it wasn't quite enough. And a couple of them went down, they came up clean, and everything was good. But uh, and, and you definitely have an issue if you have power over Ethernet phones, because your, your power consumption just it's going to tank. Yeah, right. yeah, so it's it, it's definitely a problem, and uh, fortunately, it's you know two months of the year, and the other ten you really don't have to worry about it too much. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, losing a thousand or uh, twelve hundred total transformers in a two-week period, a little brutal on systems. Uh, but you know, we scraped through, and uh, it was it wasn't horrible. But we try and get the biggest battery backup systems our plants can afford, and try and let them go as long as possible and isolate them. Uh, if they're using power over Ethernet, we don't put them on the same UPS as the phone system and, and things like that. You know, or we try and keep one, you know, powered separately with maybe its own UPS under the receptionist desk so that the phone service isn't interrupted completely. But that's about all you can do. So for your customers, are you mostly using DJM cards? It depends on the situation. Uh, with the T1 E1 or the, the T1 cards, the, the PRI cards, the, the Digium cards are actually pretty good. The single span card does not have echo cancellation on it, so I, I typically don't use that one unless the customer is like really cheap. Um, but the higher end cards are a couple grand. You know, they're uh, the what is it the the single port card is uh, almost five hundred dollars. And you move up to a thousand for a dual port and twenty two hundred for a quad port, but those are the ones with echo cancellation on them. The Rhino cards are excellent cards as well. Uh, uh, you can go to channelbanks.com. Uh, Rhino equipment, I, I do love their stuff. You don't have native support for it with uh, the basic distributions, but they'll give you a little C file, tell you how to recompile it, get it up and running. They're and it's like five minutes and I was able to get a Rhino card up and working. And I was very impressed with the Rhino equipment. The other one is Sangoma. They're uh, really doing cool stuff with their cards. I mean, some neat motherboard, daughterboard combinations that you can go from four to 24 inbound lines and T1 cards and uh, their background is more along the lines of traditional engineering types. So their stuff is really rock solid. Uh, I've been very impressed with uh, the San Goma stuff. But some people, you know, they're stuck on a brand. Oh, it's Digium, Digium, Digium. That's what we'll use. Oh, great. There's nothing wrong with the cards. I, I've used many of them, and I'm really happy with them. But Rhino and San Goma, they're coming up quick. So I've, I've been really, really satisfied with them. Is, is the San Goma supported out of the box? No. No, same with the Rhino. Uh, the San Goma is actually a little harder to get up and running than the Rhino. You have to install this whole WAN pipe driver and everything else. But once it's up and running, it's pretty straightforward. And they have good instructions, and both of those companies have just phenomenal tech support. Uh, I mean, Rhino, I called Rhino on a Sunday afternoon, and the guy was like, hey, what's going on? I'm just here working on our system. What can I do for you? And, you know, he spent three hours on the phone with me troubleshooting a problem. You know, I've, I've been really happy with that. Uh, so give, given the choice, I actually like Rhino a little better on some of their stuff. I mean, it's been good. Especially their channel bank. They've got a really sweet 24-port uh, channel bank. They can do 24 analog lines into it. And out of the back, it looks like a it's a T1 out. So I can use a PRI card in the box, and I have a really clean connection going to those. And then if the, when the client upgrades to an actual PRI line, you just take the channel bank out and plug it straight in. So it's a, a great upgrade path. And at 24 lines, your choices are pretty limited. You have a channel bank, or you have the Digium TDM 2400. It's a $2,000 card. Right. You know? So if you're going to spend $2,000, I'd rather get the Rhino so that I can take half of it away, plug in directly, and then go resell that channel bank later. So right. you know, it's a great way of doing it. Some more questions? Comments? How are we doing? About uh, uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Wow. I'm not going to fill up. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, one, one more question. Back, back to what you said about how you could sort of write the program with it and, and uh, it, would, it would run the program. 
Um, now, are there limitations on, on the language you can use, or is the configuration file just following the executable file? Mitch? Sure. <laughs> 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 the files? They're no. Just, they're plain text. No, we're talking about other, like using different languages to talk to asterisk. Now, I, I pointed to Mitch because Mitch, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like, talk to you about, a little bit about it. He actually has a, a program called Snap, which is a dialer for Windows that talks to asterisk, tells it to dial, it integrates with Outlook, it's got click to dial from Firefox and from Internet Explorer. It, it, it's got a lot of really cool integration stuff. So you can have that running on here, your, a call comes in, you see a pop-up, so, and he did that in .NET. So you want to talk about using other languages with asterisk? Yeah. Is that what you want to do, is manipulate asterisk from another language, is that what you're asking? Well, I, I, I was just sort of curious in a very general sense. If, if there was a limitation on what language you could use, or if Asterisk would simply call it a, a executable file you pulled the call. Yeah, Asterisk has a few different APIs. Um, one is it can connect out, so say if you have an incoming call, and you can have it connect out through, um, it's called AGI, and it could communicate with another process via standard input, okay. in and out, and so you could use that to control the call flow. So in your script, you could call a database and say, okay, you know, I want this to forward a cell phone or to my desk phone based on a variable in the data, so you could program it in any language. Okay, so, 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 so it just calls an SQL file then, and the SQL file is whatever you want. Right. Okay. So you do have that option. And they have plugins, I mean, there's such examples for Python, PHD, and you can, I mean, it's already the way you can there, do it if you want. Oh. There's virtually no limit to scripts that are available. The majority of <coughs> things are, are written in Perl, and um, a lot of PHP <coughs> scripts, if you're familiar with those, great. You know, if you want to look at C, there's C code, there's uh, TCL, there's Python. I mean, there's Bash scripts. I mean, there's just anything with like a standard input. All right. Yeah. So it, it makes it extremely powerful. Yeah. I, again, this is a kind of movie question, a real movie question. I'm trying to envision using something like this in my home, and I have one telco line coming in, and uh, I'm not quite sure how, I, you know. A whiteboard available? Yeah, this is a question for offline. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, I mean, kind of go over. It's uh, not a question of general interest. Uh, no, it, it probably is, actually, because it's, it's a pretty common scenario. Do you want and to be centered? What? Is he in the camera? Do you want to be centered? Let me know. <laughs> Turn off the you want to kill that? The, kill the projector for a moment? I'm actually going to, I'll actually diagram my actual configuration that I have, which is, is fairly interesting. There we go. Okay. So we have, we have our, our asterisk. Uh, box sitting out there, and I've got my uh, my wall my wall plug coming in. So I come out of my wall plug into my SPA three thousand, and for a long time this went right into my asterisk box that was sitting in my garage on my nineteen inch relay rack because I'm just as much of a geek as anybody else, and then out to. The, the phones that I had laying around my house. We, we ran our business out of our house for a while. Now we have an office. Well, I didn't move my phone line. My phone line is actually still in my house, but now my asterisk box is in my office 10 miles away from my house. So this goes out over the internet into my asterisk box and out to my phones that are in my office or to my cell phone. It also comes all the way back in to phones that I have sitting at my house because I have three phones in my house. So you call me, comes in my phone line, into my SPA 3000, out to the internet, out to my asterisk box, back to my house, over the internet, and rings my phone when I'm sitting at my desk. So it, it, you can do all kinds of crazy scenarios like that. So to start off simple, a simple interface box, plug it in, have a couple phones laying around, and you can do some pretty hey, interesting You want to have some fun? You know how you can call like from uh, if you've got Singular or some other phone company like uh, cell phone company, you make calls to the same people in the network for free. 
through the day. But what if you do something like this, and you hook up that extra cell phone, right, that you bought for your friend, you know, the friends and family thing, and that's on a different line, and you hook it up in there. So now, wherever you're at, with your cell phone, you call in network for free, and then it goes through the internet, through one of the providers that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. 1.9 cents per minute. Wouldn't that be kind of cool as an individual? Absolutely. I mean, there are just some There's crazy some really cool people. stuff you could do with this stuff. So, I mean, we're not just talking about large businesses. No, not, not at all. Um, this week, I installed my second smallest install, three stations. My smallest was two, <laughs> you know. They, they got it. They went, oh, I, I want some of these features. I want the call stuff. I want the automated attendant. I, I want these other things. You know, we bought a $300 box of fries, you know, and some $100 phones. They had a phone system that makes them, their little two-person law firm sound like some, you know, big honking law firm somewhere. You know, it, there was a lot of, of cool advantages to going to a system that we built for under a grant. How's the voicemail uh, to email? It sends a WAV file. A lot of cell phones, not Blackberries, unfortunately, but a lot of cell phones can play WAV files. So you'll get the, the email to your phone, listen to the WAV file without having to go back and check voicemail. You know, or you get it to your laptop and you, you check it there. You know, so without having to always call back in to reach your voicemail, your voicemail can come to you. So think about it. So you're sitting in here at work and you can pop in and you can see the phone messages through your email that come into your house. That's kind of cool. Yeah, or you're out, you're out of the conference or something. Yeah, a few moments ago, uh, you were talking about these, uh, I guess, DOIP providers. Mm -hmm. Now, and then you also said you're, in this system, you're connecting to the regular telephone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why wouldn't you use one of these providers rather than your telephone? Okay. So between, right? between your Astros box and the, the ITSP that's out there, what do you have in between? You have the internet. How reliable is that? Rock solid. Rock solid, exactly. There's never a hiccup anymore. There's never packet loss. Nothing, right? Yeah, not this year, you know? That's why, you know? You have quality of service issues, you have packet loss, you have poor sound quality. And now, home users, that may be fine. You know what, and what I like to say is thank God for cell phones, it lowered the bar. You know, we're used to crappy sound quality these days. <laughs> you know, so to go from this to this, no brainer. How many times do you get echo on your cell phone or scratchy sound or it sounds all garbled or maybe, I gotta call you back there, I can't understand a word you're saying on a cell phone. So it lowered the bar, you know? So, yeah, that's fine. But in a business environment, I'm not gonna cut it. Not unless this service is from the same company that's providing the circuit into your office, where you can guarantee that quality is gonna be there. So there's the two different ways of looking at it. Yeah, you're doing it yourself as your home users, feel free, play around, have fun, experiment, use it as your primary circuit. Look how popular Bonage is, and they're horrible, you know? And yet, there's two million customers, because it, it works good enough. So if good enough is okay, great. If it's not, well, then you go with traditional phone circuits. I have one last question, sort of. Related. I'm in no hurry. You guys are, I heard you guys were taking me to dinner afterwards, so I'm, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, um, Somebody told me that uh, one way to defeat uh, telemarketers is that you can, you can get your phone to transmit a signal that somehow informs their automatic dialing systems that the phone is no longer in service. Well, the very can first thing. Can I selectively? Can I put in the numbers of all my friends? Yes. And they don't get that tone, yeah. Absolutely. But everybody else does. Sure. Oh, really? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. I mean, That's just true. about anything you can conceive of, Mitch can code. So <laughs> just call him, and he'll do that for you. You know, it, it's it's it's. That's built in. And it's got a great name. It's called the ex-girlfriend feature. Yeah, we call it the ex-girlfriend feature. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> or psycho girlfriend feature, depending on how you want to look at it. Or boyfriend is the case. Yeah, but that is a, a very popular feature is to actually implement that. And I, I don't know where that, I'm, it, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where that one started, coming at the ex girlfriend feature. But yeah, it's a very popular mode. You know, the first thing, just having a voice menu will defeat virtually all telemarketers. That, that alone will stop almost all calls from coming in because they won't traverse through a phone system. And what you can often do is detect that and just set them in some crazy loop somewhere. You know, and you know, for Joe, press one, you hit one. Okay, for this, press, and you just send them on some wild goose chase where your friends know you just hit nine and it goes to your, you know, something crazy like that. But um, there's more than one person who has had to set up ex-girlfriend. So, so here's, here's this question. Skype. So the people say, Skype. Oh. They can say it was like, oh. when, when, do I, when do I look at putting something like this in versus using Skype? Well, no one's going to use Skype because it's not GPL, right? So that alone takes that right out of the equation. But why is Skype on there? I mean, what about MSN with audio? I mean, well, no. I mean, right now it's like the biggest, the biggest question I would have is like, I walk in and I got some friends who're running a small business. They say, "Well, we're using Skype." And I say, "Well, you can get more features." Well, okay. Yeah. What if you don't want to support your friends? Let them use Skype. That's yeah. what I would do. I mean, well, I know, it's like you're going, if you're going to small business, like typically you'll have like a small business, maybe like uh, half a dozen people in there that are already using Skype, or they, someone's using Skype, and they say, hey, let's just use Skype. And I'm going to sit there and say, I want to be able to say, look, you know, Skype's not giving you the full set of features you want to get. Now, the question that I have is like, what would you tell? Sure. Uh, and, and I actually have clients that, that use Skype. Number one, because one of their clients is eBay who owns Skype, and so they're kind of forced into it, but that's a specific scenario. Number one, you don't have outbound caller ID. So you call people on Skype. If you've never received a call from Skype, you'll know it the first time you get it, because the phone number is 0001234567. I go, oh, so we're on Skype calling me. Eh, whatever. You know, that's number one. You have no, no identity to the world when you're calling out with Skype. Number two, the Skype Skype doesn't have the inroad into Astro. Now, there, I'm, I'm going to say it in a very general scope because there, there are real kludgy ways to get around that that have just come out. But Skype is a peer-to-peer -peer system, not a corporate phone system. So you don't have the IPRs, the, the uh, uh, the call groups, the ring groups. You can do some of the functions in the new versions. You can have some multiple phone numbers and stuff. But it is purely internet based versus the ability to have telco. It's you know very. It's also proprietary. I mean, it, it's why companies run their own instant messaging servers versus using AIM for the, Sure, they do it with AIM, but you know, for a company, you like to have the liability of owning your own servers and backend for everything. It's actually a little more basic than that. Skype is free, they're not making any money. At some point they're going to start advertising, injecting ads inside your call stream or they're going to shut down. So it's what element of control do you want to have over your existence? Mm -hmm. How do they justify four billion dollars? They're free, so if the cost is your driver, you're not going to beat that argument. But they're not completely free. They do sell like minutes. Yeah. Well, well, minutes are free now. Well, they, they do sell some of them. And it's only until the end of the year. But plus, yeah. they have the incoming DIDs, right? Yeah. So that's where they make some money. How about so, long distance, say, to Canada or Mexico? With most of the internet telephone service providers, you can pretty much get nationwide calling plans and even to some, you know, a, a number of countries. I'm talking about with Astros. Astros doesn't care. A Astros doesn't care. Now what you can do is you can have a phone line, an ITSP, a satellite, you know, two cans and string connected to Asterisk, and you can go in and say, if it's a local call, go out here. If it's a long distance call, go out here. If it's an international call, go out here. You know, if I'm calling Joe, go out over the, the string over to the can in his house. Now if it is a corporate satellite office or something that you're calling a lot of times, you can put another Asterisk box over there and so you call through the internet. We avoid you know, voice over IP, so that'll save money. But if you're calling random people, then you've got to get one of the providers at 1.9 cents per minute or something, and they'll probably, you know, if they do it right, their stuff goes to the internet until it's a local, and then it comes out as a local call. Mm -hmm. so. Well, this is the real problem though, that Skype is very popular, and it would be nice to have income, Skype is incoming, go 
through the same uh, you sure. need to contact yeah. people at Skype to have that feature work. Well, <laughs> Skype is, is very proprietary for a reason. I mean, they've got a huge investment in that, especially now that eBay bought them. They're not going to open it up to the world. However, there are three commercial packages out there that allow you to do interfacing from Skype to Asterisk. It requires you to keep a standalone machine up and running at all times to act as a bridge. So it's one to one. For every Skype account you want coming into Asterisk, you have to dedicate one Windows machine. So. Can you use VM? That would be pretty cool. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Um, don't, they, don't they use external tools to make the audio to loop it back to the machine? Uh, I know one of them does, but there's another one. And uh, two weeks ago, it was announced that this Chinese hacking group has actually hacked the complete protocol for Skype and is going to publish it. So <laughs> it just means they'll probably change it, you know, as soon as it comes out. But they've got to do something, I would think. But they, they may not. You know, it's, it's hard to say. You know, Skype's, you know, competition to Skype would include things like the Gizmo Project, which is an open source version, peer to peer. They've got the same thing, you know, all these weird unlimited calling thing, you can call your friends and, and all that for free. And yet, they run the SIP protocol, the same as these phones do. And not only can I connect from Gizmo to any friend that's on Gizmo, I can also connect it to my asterisk box and use it as a soft phone at the exact same time. So, it, I think it's going to be competition driven to see where Skype actually goes with it and whether they open it up. Uh, Vonage said they would never do it. And then they said they will do it. And then six months went by and they said, yeah, we're going to do it. And then a year went by and they said, we're going to do it. And now they've just announced, we're actually going to do it again. And they still haven't done it. So eventually, someday, we expect that we'll be able to do a trunk to Vonage and port, you know, just use your existing Vonage phone numbers and port it right in. But even though they've promised us for 18 months now, they haven't delivered it yet. They can't. They have to wait for their Sonos Gateways upgrade before they can release the functionality. Yeah, all sense. the carriers have been talking about the Acme 2.0 upgrade now for about two years with the never Yeah. So, um, someday, maybe. Who so knows? what's the coolest things you guys have done so, with uh, Asterisk so far? He opens his front door from his cell phone. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Guys. No problem. I'm there for you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, can I still go right home? There's, there's no security <laughs> issue there at all. No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to know the phone number, but that's, you know, that's half the ballot. Right? <laughs> I'm not telling it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my duty. Sure. Pick a dialing and stuff. <laughs> that's fine. But it's all going to have my cell phone. It's going to take that a cell phone number and the number. And you have to call and from you have to know my PIN number. And then on top of that, it is voice recognition. So you have to say <laughs> open the door. You can... <laughs> <laughs> we just recorded that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His door is open, he doesn't speak. I don't think anyone ever heard him talk about when the Asterix allows you, and most of these um, open source PBXs will allow you to control your, your caller, you to call out you know, what your CLI is presented through the ITS feed. So, you know, that opens up a, a, a pretty wide plethora of options for you and okay. what you want to deal with. Like, is, is the camera still rolling? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, well. I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah, you can spoof. Caller ID is what we call it. So in a corporate environment, we want all outbound calls to look like they're coming from the same phone number. So we tell Asterisk, push out this caller ID, and we can do that. And that's great. The companies love that. And instead of having all these different phone numbers, and no matter what trunk it goes out, for the most part, we can say what the caller ID is. Now, what's really fun about that is you can program your friend's cell phone number as the caller ID, call them, and go right into their voicemail system. So by completely bypassing all security. Um, so if you have a cell phone, you might want to put a password on your voicemail. Otherwise, I can get into it just by programming my system as your cell phone number. And it'll usually drop right in. And it works with every provider out there. So uh, that is their security for voicemail, is your caller ID. And since I can spoof it, I've never done that, I'm going to say. <laughs> no, that's bad. So, so my question, so for example, um, so you set up something like this, you start depending on it for, let's say, uh, office to office between uh, Asterisk and mm -hmm. Do you have any worries about uh, about tiered service uh, coming back to uh, haunt you in a big way? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. that, that, that's why you should be going, you know, making sure that the net stays open by writing to your primary creditors. I wrote to one. 
Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got a lower back. Actually. Well, sure, but that. But I'm. I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying that, that one of the things that I look at is say, mm, you know, how much infrastructure can I well, really that's, that's the depend whole, on? Well, that's the whole. That's the whole quality of service that the telecom yeah. keeps saying. Hey, we want to guarantee the quality of service. And that's another issue we're also facing is places like the Chinese telecom want to minimize VoIP. Uh, you know, going around there for toll gate. The Department right? of Homeland so. Security just plugs in and reads the Chinese mail what it feels like. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a whole, I mean, we, we could sit here for two days just discussing security ramifications and uh, encryption and, you know, why there's actually inherent problems in the way it's designed today and where it's going and secure SIP and, and all the stuff that's going to come because it has to come and, uh, problems such as uh, net neutrality and, and all that, but for now it works. <laughs> you know? Well, if you're setting up, let's say, a corporate, a corporate uh, you know, gateway from, let's say, here to like Mexico, I assume you're going to run some sort of EDM thing. Probably, in most cases, you know, like SSH or you're going to do something, you know, probably. SSL or something. Uh, you know, if you're all on net with one provider, you, you may even have MPLS or. Who, who knows what you're going to do? But you're, as far as security, I mean, there's, there's obviously ways around, you know, to, to make sure that your call is secure. There's ways to ensure bandwidth, and, or not bandwidth, but the packet priority. Uh, you know, that again is almost a discussion in itself of what QoS is and how to set it up and how to maximize it. But, um, you know, your, your cheap $89 Linksys router today has QoS built into it. You can say, if I am plugged into that port, have, have higher priority, and wow, your call quality gets better. Okay, another home use. I wish Claude was over here, because Claude is our TiVo guy. <laughs> Wouldn't it be kind of cool to kind of dial into your Asterix machine and say, I want TiVo to record the show tonight? No, I, I have to call my wife. I'm not allowed to touch the remote. Uh, so. <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, it's like, you know, Claude did some really cool stuff with, you know, what was it, uh, X10 interface with people and stuff like that. So here you are, you can sit there and go, oh, I can call now, ask if you've got the script set up to... Oh, he, he's already done X10 to TiVo? Yeah. And there's a lot of people who have done X10 out of Asterisk. Yeah. You, you don't even need Asterisk if you, if you know your IP address for your TiVo and it's on a home network. If you get your business. It's that simple. Yeah. And remember, it's like sometimes you don't have access necessarily to the IP network. You have access to your cell phone. That's true. You know, so there's many times I'm out, you know. You're implying your cell phone doesn't have a web browser on it. What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I didn't spend an extra 10 bucks. <laughs> 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 I can call them in TV box right now. Hey. Set up. Well, we, yeah, it's it's possible. Not, yeah. We gotta get you to do the TV and Asterisk conversion. There, there, and there are people who have done that. I mean, there's almost no limit to what you can do. Think of, okay, if I can type it, what can I control? Well, look around. I mean, there's no limit to that. You know, if, if I, if something occurs, can I be notified? Oh, that's great. You know, how can I tie multiple people together? I mean, there's almost no limitation simply because Asterisk is nothing more than a toolkit. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. Does Asterisk have things it can do off the command line? Suppose I walk, was running a server one and say, you know, if such and such a process goes down, you know, Asterisk to Alex's phone number gives such and such a message. Oh, you, yeah. you yes. The, the simple that's answer another is another API you can use. Um, Asterisk says, well, in that case, you could have a script monitoring the processes. And then you could just toss a file in the directory, and then Asterisk picks up the file and initiate a call out to that okay. location. Or you could do it another way, and if you're on a remote machine, you could use um, a TCP connection uh -huh. to the manager interface in Asterisk. And you could go ahead and send it a packet, and it'll initiate out a call. So it's got ins and outs everywhere. And, and the reverse, if you know you call into Asterisk, it can then fire off a curl script somewhere. Right, that would be the AGI. Do something. Right. So, now I'm curious, like, why would you want to ask a section to call out as opposed to send out a text message through your standard IP? Well, that's not nearly as cool. I got a phone system. Well, I was really sort of lumping the two together in my thinking. <laughs> because normally I just you know, email it out to the appropriate. What about if someone's handicapped and they're blind? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's always a reason. 
for something. You know, maybe it's easier that way, or maybe it's just it dials an extension at the sysadmin's desk. And well, well most likely you're, you're dialing the security guy who doesn't know how to log into the email anyway. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so. But you know, anything that you can script, anything that you can code, anything that you can monitor, you know, any way that you are comfortable with programming. There, there's a way to talk to it and have it talk back. Oh, okay. So it's it's extremely flexible. As Mitch said, there's multiple APIs, there's multiple interfaces, there's multiple ways of doing the same thing. Right. From from as easy as dropping a text file in the call directory and it initiates the call to actually sending packets directly into Asterisk and saying, do these functions for me. So you, there's a, a variety of different ways of doing it. Now, how many of you guys have a large family at home or a lot of roommates? Okay. So yeah, that's where the voicemail part gets nice. If you had a large family, you're like, okay, everyone's got their own little voicemail box. And so my well, brother keeps erasing my messages. Yeah, I mean, that's the, part, the, the, problem, the problem I have, I, I have teenagers, you know, and yeah, and it's a major problem, you know, and it, if, uh, if the girl picks up the phone, what are the odds of that message getting to the boy? Never. Exactly. Mm. You know, but you put a cheap phone in their room, they each have their own extension, their friends call the house, press one for Chris, it goes to him. Actually, they have their own line, so it calls him, and those are the only two choices because our phone has a different phone number, so the parent's phone is different. Even though it's all handled by the same system, you know, our phone lines come in and they're handled different. Their phone line comes in, it's handled different. They have their own voicemail accounts. They have their own individual phone numbers now. I mean, it, it, you can do some really nice stuff with it. It's not limited to just one input, one output. You can, I, we have one box actually running five completely separate businesses in it. You have no idea that they're all running on the same box. The calls come in, they're handled completely differently. There's different sets of extensions. You would never know that that box handled more than one business. And yet there's, I have one that's got five on it and mine in my office actually runs three separate businesses on it. So you, you can do a lot of cool stuff with a single box to manage either multiple businesses or like I said, in the home use, you know, parents line, kids line, you know, have them with, you know, ITSP accounts because the, who cares if they're call quality? Hey, your your call sounds quit, sounds bad. Quit downloading BitTorrents, you know, and you know, the call quality comes back, you know. So you you can do a lot of interesting things like that and to play around with it. it it's kind of fun. Uh, would I be able to do anything meaningful on a 233 megahertz machine? You can get it running. Absolutely. My first one was a 300, and I mean, I ran my business on a 300 megahertz machine for like six months. And you know, for a couple of call, couple of lines, couple of calls coming in, it ran. It's a minimum routing. Basically, if you can run CentOS, Astros will run. So I've seen it run on as little as 128 megs. I don't like that because CentOS will actually bitch if you don't have 384. But uh, you know, I know people who are running 256. I prefer a gig on a corporate machine. But you know, a lot of the machines have 512 to 384 and. They'll run fine. I mean, you're not trying to, you're not going to stack, you know, 20 concurrent phone calls on that box. Play with it. If the call quality is really bad, you know, get a better box, you know. But you can certainly learn and play and test and develop and try different things and see whether it's worth it or not to get a better box, you know. Like I said, we've run businesses on a box that I bought at Fry's for 300 bucks, so. You know, and that's a gigahertz machine. It can't be too much to get a, a used box somewhere. You know, that's a couple hundred megahertz to that, to do something more on if you're really having problems on a smaller machine. But if you can run Linux, you can run Asterisk. It, it's pretty much that simple. It's not a big load on the box at all. It, it's not having the system there. It's really how many concurrent calls you have is what's going to determine whether a machine can handle it or not. Is there a reason why you use Cento, why you want to use Cento OS or versus Debian or Ubuntu? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I know you keep saying that. Kind of yeah. Well, because I, I was kind of more referring to the tricks box oh, okay. because that's what comes with that. Um, there actually seems to be a little more support for Cent OS when it comes to drivers and code is. All the developers for free PBX are all using Cent OS, and so there's kind of like this ingrained, you know pseudo relationship there. 
But there's plenty of people that are running Red Hat, Debian, Ubuntu, uh, Slackware. What do you run? Um, Windows? <laughs> CentOS or Fedora Core? Fedora Core, you know, um, what's that? R, R, or Pound Key or R Pound? R, R Path. Um, you know, I mean, people have put it on all kinds of things. Uh, <coughs> you know, you can, uh, you can install on a Linksys router. You know, and you can, uh, tons of little embedded systems that you can put it on. Um, AST Linux is, not AST Linux, AST, AST Linux is a distribution that is supposed to run on a compact flash card. You know, I mean, there, there's just a ton of different ways of making it work. So you're not limited by the OS per se, only in terms of the software drivers for the, some of the PCI cards. And there is no uh, Digium driver for the cards for Ubuntu right now. And I think they're a little lacking on Debian right now. If you're not using those, sky's the limit. Were you serious about running on a router? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, um, in Chicago, there's about a, uh, I think they're up to about 90 nodes running Linksys WRT54s. And they flash the ROMs with uh, the embedded version of it, and they've tied them all in together into this big mesh. It's pretty crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, there's um, a version of the DD-WRT firmware that has the uh, firm called Sur in it, which is a, a SIP router that you can do a lot of cool stuff with. So yeah, I mean, you, you can do it. You're, you're going to lose functionality because you're, you're limited in scope, you're not gonna be able to you know, run up 100 voicemail accounts on it because you're just not gonna have storage, yeah. but you will be able to mount a remote drive somewhere and use that as your voicemail storage. Yeah. Uh, what's your book? It's called um, uh, Getting Started with Trixbox. It's published by Pack Publishing out of London and uh, should hit the stores probably in about 45 days. So. I'll make a big fuss about it when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs>